This week on Myth, I'll be telling the legend of the lost colony of Roanoke. You'll find out that you should never piss off an island, that the British colonists were kind of assholes, and that betraying your Native American friends can have centuries worth of consequences. Then, in Gods and Monsters, you'll find out why Twilight's Jacob was definitely an evil witch. This is the Myths Your Teacher Hated podcast, where I tell the stories of cultures from around the world in all of their original, bloody, uncensored glory. Modern tellings of these stories have become dry and dusty, but I'll be trying to breathe new life into them. This is episode 3, Never Go Back to Corpse Rape Island. As always, this episode is not safe for work. This week's story, like most legends, begins with historical fact and quickly descends into the fucking insane. Back in the early days of the American colonies, a man named John White, I know it sounds like the front man of an acoustic indie band, but that was his name, went to Sir Walter Raleigh, the same man that Raleigh, North Carolina is named after, and his half-brother, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, to get money for an expedition to set up a new colony. This seemed like a good investment at the time, so they agreed. In 1587, White made his second attempt at setting up a colony. His first location didn't pan out, so they settled on Roanoke Island, a small barrier island off the coast of what is now North Carolina. You have to understand what life was like for the first settlers. In a word, it was fucking miserable. America was still an untamed wilderness, and the early colonists really had no goddamned idea what they were doing. They were farmers, sure, but they were used to having cities to fall back on in a pinch, and they didn't understand that this new country was different from the one they had left, and it kicked their asses. At the time that Roanoke was settled, England had spent nearly a decade failing to make a permanent foothold in the New World. Spain was already setting up shop in the South, and since Spain and England were heavyweight rivals, think Superman and Lex Luthor, and I'll let you decide who is who, the Virgin Queen was desperate to get something going. In 1578, Queen Elizabeth I sent Sir Gilbert to find something that Spain hadn't already put their grubby fucking hands on, and put his grubby fucking hands on it instead. So long as the land wasn't already claimed by a Christian king, it was fair game. So fuck the natives. During Gilbert's second expedition, his ship was lost in a storm. With Gilbert sleeping with the fishes, Raleigh took over and ran the expedition for Roanoke. One settlement at Roanoke had already failed and been lost to the wilderness before John White even set one fucking foot on colonial soil. White had been part of Raleigh's first attempt at settling Roanoke, which ended in disaster. In 1585, a man named Sir Richard Granville brought a small, shitty army to Roanoke. When he left, the colonists were still on good terms with the local tribes, the Sakotan and the Croatan. First Granville, and then White, went back to England for supplies, and brought two tribesmen, Wanchis and Menteo, with him as emissaries to the Queen. I'm sure that I'm getting those pronunciations wrong. When John White came back with his new group of settlers, everyone at Roanoke was dead, missing, or vanished. Signs of violence were everywhere. The commanding officer, Ralph Lane, started the costly war with the tribes, leading to attacks over the course of a few months. The surviving reports give no indication that the natives had turned hostile or been anything but welcoming to the leading force of what would be a massive invasion. Instead, it all started over a goddamn trinket. The colonists lost one of the silver cups, and Lane decided that the natives had stolen it, likely because they were heathens and therefore did not know right from wrong, with little to no evidence. In a completely even-handed retaliation for stealing a fucking cup, they attacked a Sakotan village, burned it to the ground, then burned the chief alive. What a dick. The colonists quickly realized that they had essentially started a ground war in Russia in winter. They didn't know the land, they were undersupplied, and they had no reinforcements. They holed up inside the fort and tried to ride out the hostilities, but unprovoked wars don't just stop. Funny how that works. The hostilities became violence, with natives leading raids against the fort itself, and the men grew desperate. A team of three were sent on an expedition into the woods to find food and supplies. One night, while they were away, Lane saw a ship in the distance. He and his men said, fuck this shit, and abandoned the settlement, including the three poor bastards still wandering around in the woods looking for berries, and rowed out to the ship. The ship's captain, the famous Sir Francis Drake, took them with him back to England, because what else was he supposed to fucking do? When Grenville returned, he found the settlement abandoned and damaged, and the three men who had been left behind 
missing and presumed killed to death. Deciding that discretion is the better part of valor, and that it was way better to leave other people to die on the ass end of nowhere than to stay and die with the group you convinced to go in the first place, Grenville left 15 men to defend the broken and empty town from the still very much angry natives, and went back to England for more supplies. He was a coward, but he was a smart coward. No Englishman ever saw the 15 fighting men ever again. They were missing and presumed sacrificed. John White left after Grenville with more supplies and more people, only to find the place once again completely abandoned. The settlement, consisting of 117 souls, which included 97 men, 17 women, and 9 boys, made landfall in July. The 15 men they were supposed to be meeting were in the wind. White, not being a total moron, wanted to sail further north and try to establish a settlement near Chesapeake Bay in modern-day Virginia. As this would one day become the first successful English colony, his instincts were good. Unfortunately, the captain, one Simon Fernandez, was done with this cursed place and people and told them to get the fuck off his ship right here and now. Given that the ship was full of scary sailors and that none of the colonists knew how to pilot a ship, they reluctantly agreed. They had nowhere to go, so they moved into the haunted-ass town. Given that they had some supplies now, they decided that the first order of business was trying to repair relations with the local populace. Given that they had made friends with two of the tribesmen, White thought they had a good chance. This place didn't seem so bad. He had forgotten that this was the wild motherfucking West, that they were walking a goddamn knife edge, and if they made one slip, it could leave them lying in a pool of their own blood. Nine days after landing, they were reminded of this inconvenient fact when one of their colonists, George Howe, was killed by one of the tribes while crabbing along the shore. In spite of the blood feud, White persevered in his attempt to make nice-nice with the Sakotan and Croatan Indians. His Croatan friend, Manteo, the first Native American to be baptized as a Protestant, had returned with Grenville and went as emissary to his people on Hatteras Island and was able to secure a peace. Juan Cheese didn't take to his new friends the same way. He had also returned with Grenville, but he quickly soured on the English, decided they were invaders, and returned to his people. Legend says that Juan Cheese hated the Englishmen he'd been living with enough to have been part of the force that killed the 15 men left behind by Grenville. Maybe he just got a glimpse of the future and saw how destructive the white man would be for the people already living in the country that the queen thought was hers by right of planting a damned flag. Even without Juan Cheese's help, the peace seemed to be holding. White had tried something different than the previous expeditions, which initially proved fruitful. Instead of bringing soldiers and mercenaries, he brought families and gave them a stake in the venture. They weren't just pulling a paycheck, they were starting a new life. This seemed embodied in the birth of his granddaughter, the first Protestant baby born in the New World. Virginia Dare was born on August 18, 1587, to Eleanor and N.I.S. Dare. Things were looking up. But since this is a Halloween story, you know it won't last. The colonists had arrived late in the season and had missed their chance to plant crops. They had brought supplies with them, but not enough to get them through the coming winter. Partly, this was due to unpredictability of a long sea voyage, and partly this was due to shitty flicking planning. Which is why, less than a week after his daughter gave birth to Virginia, John White left for England again. The governor figured he could be back by the new year, in time to resupply the colony for the worst of the winter. He was wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. He didn't just decide, fuck those guys. Roanoke is cold and the city has whores. He actually wanted to go back pretty fucking bad. The Queen forbade it. England was in the throes of a war with Spain. This is when the Spanish Armada made a complete fuck-up of the world's greatest navy and was sent back to Spain with its tail between its legs. Incidentally, this war turned the sea lanes around England into total shit. While the war was going on, and it dragged on for years, he couldn't leave. There were no ships and no money to fund a trip. Given the fact that multiple expeditions had failed spectacularly, he was extremely worried about the colony and his family. He didn't set foot on American soil for another three years. In a twist so bizarre that can only be real life, White would land at Roanoke on August 18, 1590, his granddaughter's third birthday. He arrived to find a ghost town. The fort was overgrown with grass, weeds, and roots. Unlike the last time, however, there were no signs of violence. No burned wood, no broken weapons, no bodies. What he found instead disturbed him more. The town's belongings were scattered on the ground and left to rust and rot. The housing was gone. Not burned down, not broken, gone. Someone had taken the time to carefully and thoroughly disassemble everything but the town fence. 
cherished, and at that time, very expensive and very rare books were lying in the dirt being eaten by mold. Rusted, but otherwise intact cannons lay strewn about as if people had simply abandoned them where they stood and walked off. Chests that had been locked and buried to protect valuables were broken open on the cold ground, and everything inside was taken or left to rot. Family portraits and children's toys were scattered about, watching John White wander around the town with reproach for not having been there when they damned well needed him. Before he left, White, realizing the Sakotans were still murderously pissed at the colonists, gave the town a signal to use in case they were in danger and had to abandon the town for somewhere safer. Before they left for safer ground, they were supposed to carve a Maltese cross into a few of the trees to let him know they got away safely. He was creeped the hell out by what he had found so far, but since there definitely hadn't been any violence, he figured they must have left for some reason, so he went looking for the signal. What he found instead were two graves that looked to have been dug in no haste, so the two men had probably died of natural-ish causes. On a post of the fort wall, there was a carving. This was it. This was the signal that everyone was safe. He walked closer and saw that it was not, in fact, the cross. Instead, the word Croatoan was carved into the wood. Looking around, figuring there had to be more, he saw another carving nearby. He approached it, and again, it was not the cross. Etched into a tree were the three letters C, R, and O. He kept looking for the signal or any other sign, but found nothing. White took this to mean that the settlers had gone to live with Manteo and the somewhat friendlier Croatan tribe. The word carved was very similar to the tribe name after all, and people weren't terribly good at spelling at that time. But he didn't have provisions to survive in the New World on his own, and a storm was approaching, so his ship wasn't going to wait for him. He had to either leave right fucking now and protect his ships, or stay while the ship sailed away and probably die here all alone. He made the smart choice and went back home to England, where he died three years later, unable to mount a rescue mission. That's where history ends and legend begins. No one ever saw the colonists again, and there is no definitive explanation as to why they disappeared, but there are plenty of stories. I'll start with the plausible stories and ramp up to the pants-shittingly horrifying legends. John White's theory was that the people had encountered some hardship, possibly at the hands of the Sakotans, who were, for some reason, still nursing a grudge about the white men raising a town and torturing their leader to death. John Lawson, an English explorer, wrote in 1709 that he met Croatans living on Hatteras Island who claimed to be descended from white settlers, indicated they had indeed interfucked. Since they had gray eyes, he believed them. Recent DNA researches into surviving descendants and some recent archaeological evidence seems to support this theory. Since this podcast is about legends and myths rather than history, I'll leave this theory there and let you read up on it on your own if you want to. In the slightly disturbing story, the colony ran into trouble and realized that they weren't going to be able to hold out through the winter at Roanoke. They knew that White wanted to set up a colony at Chesapeake and decided to try and make their way there on foot. They didn't know exactly where they were going, and they didn't know exactly where they were, so it was a long shot, but it was better than the certain death they were probably facing. They left behind anything they couldn't carry and started walking. The cannons, the books, the pictures, all were left behind to try to make the trek easier. They set out west past the wetlands, looking for a way to a better place to settle. It worked out well until 1591, a year after White had come back looking for them, when the group was ambushed. They had unknowingly wandered into hostile territory. The attack killed most of the settlers, including Anias Dare and four-year-old Virginia. Only seven people survived, and they knew they wouldn't survive long. Eleanor Dare, White's daughter, carved their story into a stone near the Chowan River, 65 miles west of Roanoke, and signed her initials under the grim prediction that the last English settlers would soon be dead. They left the bodies of their friends and family where they lay, unable to dig enough graves for all the dead, and walked off to their own certain deaths. The stone was found in 1937, and was dubbed the Dare Stone or the Chowan Stone. Emory University in Georgia certified the stone authentic, as it was written in genuine Elizabethan English. More than 40 forgeries were created and sold after, casting doubt on the original, but modern historians have started to speculate that the original was legitimate. Of course, this directly conflicts with the story about living with the Croatans, and they can't both be fucking true. Another version of the story, which conflicts with both of the previous versions, says that the group beat the odds and made it to Chesapeake Bay. They set up a new town, but it didn't last long. By the time Jamestown was founded, everyone was long dead. John Smith, yes, that John Smith, 
claimed in 1608 that Pocahontas' father, Powhatan, claimed to have killed a group of white colonists before Smith had arrived. Smith said that Powhatan had personally led the attack party and killed the last few men himself. Of course, given how much John Smith lied about, there is a lot of doubt about this story. In the slightly more disturbing still story, the entire colony was rounded up by the Sakotans, taken back to their village, and burned alive in further escalation of the retaliation feud for killing their chief. Which, remember, started because they lost a fucking cup. They would have had to have snuck past the wall in the night and taken the guards before they could raise the alarm. In this story, the natives came back to the village after everyone was dead and took what they wanted. Having no use for books, cannons, or pictures, they left them in the street but drove the livestock back to their own village for food. One of the major problems with trying to discover what really happened is that in spite of being a cartographer and an artist, the location of the colony was lost along with the colonist. No definitive evidence of the missing colonist has ever been discovered. And of course, none of these stories explains why the word Croatoan was carved in the post. If the villagers had left safely on their own, why not carve the all safe signal? If the colonists were killed in a surprise attack, then who carved the word using English letters? Why did they disassemble their houses? And none of this explains some of the weird incidents that have cropped up around the word Croatoan, leaving some to tell much darker tales about what happened. Edgar Allan Poe disappeared a few days before his death. On October 3rd, 1849, Poe was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore and was taken to Washington Medical College, where he died on October 7th. He was never coherent enough to explain where he had been, what had happened to him, or why he was wearing clothes that were not his. Legend says that he repeatedly called out the name Reynolds and whispered the word Croatoan. Legend also says that the word was scribbled on other sites associated with weird disappearances. The journal of Amelia Earhart after her disappearance in 1937, carved into the post of the last bed horror writer Ambrose Bierce ever slept in before vanishing in Mexico in 1913, scratched into the wall of the cell that the notorious stagecoach robber Black Bart inhabited just before being released and disappearing without a trace in 1888, and perhaps, most disturbingly, written on the last page of the logbook of the ship Carol A. Deering, when it ran aground in Cape Hatteras in 1921, not far from Roanoke. When rescuers went out to help the sailors, they discovered that the ship had been completely abandoned with no explanation and, apparently, right in the middle of dinner, since food had been left out in the middle of preparing it as if everyone had just gotten up and walked away at the same time, with no signs of violence. Sounds a lot like what happened at Roanoke. Taken together, it's a pretty fucking creepy series of events. Which leads to the best legend of what happened to the colonists and what Croatoan means. The natives living on Roanoke Island said that their island had a spirit. Not an intangible, colors of the wind bullshit spirit, but a genuine corporeal spirit that can manifest to protect the tribes and the island when angered. It can be roused by certain rituals and ceremonies. And the 15 men who were burned alive in retribution for their chief, either by accident or design, the Sakotans had roused the vengeful spirit of Roanoke during their mass sacrifice, and, steeped in the blood of the English colonists, it thirsted for more. The colonists didn't carve the Maltese cross because they didn't leave. They didn't believe what was happening. The Croatan warrior Manteo came to the settlement and told them the story, but the colonists refused to believe. The explanation didn't sit well with their strict religious beliefs, so they were dismissed out of hand. The Croatans believed that the spirit endured after death, and could walk the earth if it chose. They also believed in greater spirits that manifested in the elements. And, most importantly, they believed in an evil spirit, a powerful source of evil, not that different from the Christian idea of Satan. This spirit roamed the earth in the form of a spectral serpent, and could latch on to a victim's soul, poisoning the poor creature and causing it to become territorial, violent, and venomous. The host would exude a miasma that could infect other people, either in close quarters or by skin-to-skin -skin contact, depending on the version. In other words, the snake demon turned people into a walking fucking demon plague. The Croatans reported to later colonists that, simultaneous with the disappearance of the colonists, the animals of the forest were massacred. Overnight, nearly all species of wildlife died abruptly of seemingly natural causes. Animals dropped dead where they stood, and all of the birds over the island fell out of the sky. This was a sign of the evil spirit's presence. Manteo warned the colonists to stay out of the forest until the demon had passed. Dismissing it as pagan superstition, they sealed their own doom. Never mind the fact that they totally fucking believed in demons, just Christian ones. Sometime after Manteo left, 
Eleanor and Virginia went out into the woods to pick berries and mushrooms. The settlement had been tense ever since they heard the crazy story that they definitely didn't believe in even a little, and she wanted to let her daughter have some time to play and relax without absorbing the stress of the grown-ups. Virginia ran around the woods with the boundless energy of the young, laughing and investigating all of the plants and animals. They had walked out of sight of the fort's walls when Eleanor saw her daughter's gaze get caught by something up ahead. She reached out and tried to grab Virginia's shoulder, but the child was too quick. Laughing at this fun new game and excited to see whatever it was she had found, she ran off. When Eleanor had caught up, she thought she saw a large snake coiled up in the tall grass in front of her daughter and saw a small arm reached out to touch. With a cry, she yanked her daughter away, fearing it was too late to stop her from being bitten. But when she did, nothing was there. There was no snake. She decided she must have imagined it. Virginia was unusually solemn on the trek back. Her large eyes watched everything, though, and she smiled when they approached the open gate. Safe back inside, Eleanor quickly forgot the whole thing. She was far more concerned with the growing tension inside the compound. The Sakotan hadn't staged a raid in a while, but no one thought that they had given up. The colonists had the shit end of the stick, and everyone knew it. It was only a matter of time before they tried again to murder every last one of them, and the wait was driving everyone mad. As the days went by, nothing kept happening. Food was running low, but no one wanted to go hunting. Fear started to turn into anger, and small resentments festered and grew. The villagers could almost feel the hatred slithering around the cabins. No one saw the serpent demon latched on to the little girl's soul, but they could all feel its effects. The poison spread, and the anger bubbled until it finally boiled over. The hungry people, driven by the snake demon, realized that there was an abundant food supply right there in town. All they had to do was take it. People started to disappear in the night. The violence was blamed on the long-expected Sakotan raid for the first few days, but some of the townspeople started to look less hungry and better fed. Before long, someone grew suspicious and decided to investigate. Behind Eleanor's cabin, he found signs of fresh digging. Whomever it was hadn't been trying very hard, because there was only a thin layer of dirt over what was buried beneath. They were bones, human bones, picked clean. Someone was eating the villagers. The snake demon's venom drove him to react. He couldn't go get help. Screaming in fear and anger, he drew his belt knife and charged in. Inside, he found a group of men, women, and a child sitting around their grisly feast. Still screaming wordlessly, he attacked. Outnumbered, he died quickly. But his screams had roused the town, or what was left of it. Violence spread like a tidal wave through the town, until nearly everyone was fighting, bleeding, and dying. The suddenness and the closeness of the violence made the muskets impractical. It was a war to the knife. Quickly, the violence peaked and ebbed. Virginia smiled. Here was a feast indeed. One man had carved Croatoan on the gatepost as a warning and as a map as to where help could be found. The Croatans had warned them that this was coming. He knew that John White was coming back, and he didn't want anyone falling prey to this horror. He was in the middle of carving the word on a tree in the direction of the tribe as a guidepost when a dagger slid between his ribs. He died, having only carved the first three letters. His last image was of the little girl standing over him, grinning hungrily at the spreading pool of blood. The demon snake's cannibals weren't able to stay in the village and enjoy their feast, however. The survivors, driven by the evil spirit's venom, dragged the bodies through the forest to the Sakotan village. They were expected. The bodies were stacked like cordwood, and the remaining English were bound and placed atop the gruesome mound. It wasn't until the flames started licking at their ankles that the demon's compulsion faded. They had enough time to feel the horror of what they had done and fear at what was about to happen before they were engulfed. The Sakotans chanted as their sacrifice was offered up to the serpent spirit. Their vengeance had been achieved. Knowing that the village was empty, they raided it for supplies. They took down the cabins for the lumber and drove the livestock back to their own village. They ransacked the supplies and dug up the buried chests, which hadn't been buried long enough to erase the signs of digging, and left behind anything they didn't need. The Croatans felt the demon's departure and saw the empty town. They knew what had happened. Many years later, when another group of colonists made their way here after setting up successful colonies elsewhere, their descendants told the story the way it had been told to them. Again, the strictly religious colonists disregarded the story as superstition. But the demon is not gone. He slithers the earth still, looking for more souls to latch onto and infect. As a note, I've taken a few liberties with this story. 
The versions of the story I could find only said that the demon infected the colonists through John White's daughter and granddaughter, that they turned to cannibalism, some versions say vampirism, and killed each other off. I've tried to string these story elements together to make a more cohesive and compelling narrative while staying true to the legend's core. This is a story that pops up a lot in popular culture, including appearances in a Batman Spawn crossover comic, an episode of Supernatural, an episode of Angel, the Stephen King novel Storm of the Century, and most recently, in season 6 of American Horror Story. It's a compelling story without a conclusive explanation, so it's easy to see why. And now, it's time for Gods and Monsters. This is a segment where I get into a little more detail about the personalities and history of one of the gods or monsters from this week's pantheon that was not discussed in the main story. Given the prevalence of native mythology in the story, and that it's a Halloween story, this week's monster comes from the Diné, or Navajo. The same creature does appear in mythology of other nearby tribes, but I'll use the Navajo version. Diné means the people, and it's what the Navajo named themselves. This creature is known as the Yi Naglashi, or the Skinwalker and is a Navajo witch who can turn himself into or disguise himself as an animal. The name literally translates to he who walks on all fours, and the story is one that the Navajo are reluctant to discuss with outsiders. A skinwalker is a shaman gone bad. As bad as a man can go. In Navajo folklore, there is a clear distinction drawn between a medicine man or shaman and a witch. The medicine man practices the white arts, healing, blessing, curse removal, that sort of thing. He dedicates his life to helping others. A witch is, without exception, evil. He practices the black arts and is dedicated only to himself. He uses his magics to help himself and to hurt other people. The skinwalker is always a witch. Given their location in the American Southwest, the preferred forms were wolf, coyote, bear, and bird, but there are stories of skinwalkers turning into all sorts of other creatures for various malevolent purposes. Inside his stolen skin, the Yi Naglashi becomes a fucking nightmare, inheriting the beast's strength, speed, or mythological cunning, all driven by a malevolent human intelligence. Skinwalkers, in addition to shapeshifting, can perform other terrible magics. They can use mind control to make the victims hurt themselves or others, or even to commit suicide. They can also perform powerful curses. In the mid-1970s, a lawyer named Michael Stuff filed papers against a witch. His client, a Navajo woman who lived on the reservation with her son, was in a legal battle with her ex over custody of the boy. At one point, when it began to look like she would win full custody, the man got permission to spend an evening with his son. They didn't return until the next morning. According to the boy, they spent the night with a witch. He built a fire on top of a cliff, and for many hours, the man performed ceremonies, songs, and incantations around the fire. As dawn broke, the three traveled into the woods to find a small cemetery. They dug a hole and buried two dolls carved from wood. One was a woman carved from dark wood. The other was a man carved from light wood. The boy thought they were meant to represent the mother and her lawyer. Stuff wasn't sure how seriously to take the story, so they consulted a Navajo professor. He told them the ceremony was a dark and terrible sympathetic magic. If you don't know, sympathetic magic is basically voodoo. You take a small thing meant to represent a large thing and connect the two with magic. Afterwards, what happens to the small thing happens to the large. The dolls had been connected and then buried in the fucking cemetery. It was intended to put the woman and her lawyer six feet under. According to legend, a witch can only perform this curse four times in his lifetime because after that, he risks having the curse turned back on himself. That's some serious shit. Not all witches are skinwalkers, but all skinwalkers are witches. Skinwalking is seriously hard and seriously evil, so they are the hot shit in the native witch community, which makes them some of the most evil fuckers around. They make people sick, they commit murders, they rob graves, they fuck the dead. Holy shit, that escalated quickly. To even become a skinwalker, you have to kill a close relative, usually a parent or sibling, as part of the initiation. And you have to be fucking serious to walk the left-hand path because, by Navajo law, a witch has forfeited his status as a human and can be killed with impunity. It is very difficult to get the DNA to talk about the skinwalkers to outsiders, even in casual terms. Practitioners of Adishgash or witchcraft, are dangerous, and skinwalkers are the worst of the worst. Few Navajo want to risk crossing paths with the Yi Naglashi, and talking about the witch is to risk drawing its attention. After all, since the skinwalkers are shapeshifters, the person you are speaking to could easily be a skinwalker himself, looking for his next victim. It is said that, at night, their eyes can glow like hot coals, and if you see their face, they have to kill you. 
If you see a Naglashi and know who it really is, it will die. So if you see one, it has to kill you to make sure you don't find out who it really is and thus kill it. And they don't just fucking strike you dead in an instant or anything pleasant like that. No, they make you suffer. Their preferred method of murder is to blow corpse powder in your face, which is, like it sounds, made from robbing a grave and grinding up a fucking corpse. In the hours after, your tongue turns black, you go into painful convulsions, and after suffering immensely, die. If they don't have easy access, and is a shapeshifter who can turn into any animal, they usually do. They can conjure up evil spirits, like the demon that supposedly destroyed Roanoke, but smaller, and send them to do their bidding. On a Navajo reservation in Arizona, they tell a story about a woman who delivered newspapers in the early morning. She was making her rounds in the pre-dawn darkness with her baby in the seat beside her, since it's fucking impossible to find a babysitter at 3 in the morning, when she heard scratching sounds at the passenger door. Bear in mind, she's driving right now. She couldn't see anything through the windows, but then the door was flung open to reveal a half-man, half-beast, with glowing red eyes and a clawed, hairy arm, twisted unnaturally and swelling with muscle, reaching for the child in the car seat. With one hand, she tried to keep the grasping claw from finding her baby, and with the other, wrenched the steering wheel away from the creature she slammed on the gas. She breathed a sigh of relief as the car leapt ahead of the creature, leaving the twisted arm behind. Her relief was short-lived. In the rearview mirror, she could see the glowing eyes in the road, and they were getting larger. The thing was running faster than her recklessly speeding car. It stayed with her, slowly catching up, until she screeched into an all-night convenience store with a squeal of burning rubber. She jumped out of the car, child in her arms, and ran inside screaming at the clerk that something was following her. But when he ran outside, the night was empty. The Naglashi was gone. Another story comes from a New Mexico Highway Patrol officer. Late at night, he would patrol a deserted stretch of highway south of Gallup, New Mexico. On two separate nights, he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. A ghastly form appeared out of the night and attached itself to his car window. When he turned his head, he saw what he could only describe as an unearthly being wearing a ghostly mask, sailing along beside his window at highway speeds. After a moment, he realized that the creature was not attached to his window, it was running along beside his cruiser as he sped along the empty desert. After a few minutes of grinning murderously at the officer while running at an impossible rate of speed, it vanished into the night. Over coffee, another officer admitted to having had a similar encounter with the white-masked ghoul. There are many, many stories of the Naglashi, in legend and in fiction. But one of my favorite depictions of the dreaded skinwalker is in Jim Butcher's novel, Turncoat. The story does a fantastic job of describing the abilities, the power, and the sheer evil of the Navajo witch. If you're interested in learning more about the skinwalker, I highly recommend it. That's it for this episode of Myths Your Teacher Hated. Keep up with new episodes on our Facebook page, on iTunes, on Stitcher, or on TuneIn. Or you can follow us on Twitter as at HardcoreMyth. You can also find news and episodes on our website, at MythsYourTeacherHated.com. If you like what you've heard, I'd appreciate a review on iTunes, since it helps increase the show's standing and lets more people know that it exists. If you have any questions, any gods or monsters you'd want to learn about, or any ideas for future stories that you'd like to hear, feel free to drop me a line. I'm trying to pull as much material from as many different cultures as possible, but there are a lot of stories I've never heard, so suggestions are appreciated. The theme music is by Tiny Cheese Puff, whom you can find on Fiverr.com. Next time... I'll be telling a story that's near and dear to my heart. It's the Norse account of the invention of beer. It's got everything you could hope for from a myth about alcohol. Breaking glass, drunken brawls, and probably the worst secret ingredient ever. That's all for now. Thanks for listening.